Hey. Hello, I, um, I'm just calling to uh, re report what may be an, an emergency. It's just in Oxford. I could hear a woman getting slapped about next door to my room. I've left and just got out of there because I didn't want to hear it. It wasn't a woman. It was a 14-year-old child, raped and afterwards beaten. Indescribably awful is how a review today termed what happened to her and other children like her over a five-year period. A period in which so many opportunities to help them, we heard today, were missed. What happened to the victims, to these children, detailed in this serious case review, is deeply disturbing and shocking. Readers of the report will be upset and quite rightly want to know how these children could have been subjected to such appalling sexual exploitation for so long. Was deeply the catalyst for this review, the jailing two years ago of seven men for a litany of crimes against children. Were you involved in any sexual activities with any girl knowing they were under 13 years of age? Six young women gave evidence against them children at the time when these men groomed them with drink, drugs and attention and then having raped them, brought in others to do the same. There was a pack mentality. If one had had it, they would encourage everybody to have it. I was not sure that physically my body could actually take it. There were gang rapes, threats to kill. One girl was raped, then urinated upon, another branded with a hot hairpin. One mother said the men had left her child with nothing but aggression. This is how the detective who caught them put it. They start out at sort of 11 or 12, just an ordinary girl, um, in our case. And um, by the time they finished, they're hollow. They're shells of what they should be. Uh, and the little girl that was in there is gone. Today's serious case review says that from 2005 to 11, the girls were badly let down by those meant to protect them. There was no evidence, it said, of willful neglect, but there was plenty of evidence of weak organisation, national guidance not being followed, insufficient curiosity, and judgmental attitudes which viewed the girls as bringing the problems upon themselves. As a result, the girls were sometimes treated without common courtesies and, as one victim said, by snide remarks. It wasn't just that the children were being viewed at times as authors of their own downfall, some of their own parents, too, were seen as partly responsible for the mayhem, mayhem created by the men abusing their children. At one point, remarkably, a social worker dismisses to colleagues the father of one child as, quote, obsessed with finding her when she goes missing. And these children went missing. From 2005 to 2010, the six girls at the centre of this case were reported missing around 500 times. And we learned today that the police had one and a half thousand recorded contacts with the girls during the period under review. But all agencies demonstrated insufficient curiosity. I had a feeling police knew what was happening to me, but I was a child. I didn't want to admit what was happening to me. There are many shocking incidents cited in this report, one of which involves an unnamed police officer who in 2007 found a 13-year-old girl hiding in a car with a man. There were condoms in the car. They said to the officer they were just friends. And what did the officer do? According to the report, he gave the man advice and sent him on his way. He later submitted a report, but no further action appears to have been taken. Much has been said about a lack of understanding around grooming at the time, but as one paragraph in the review succinctly puts it, one doesn't need training in child sexual exploitation to know that a 12-year-old sleeping with a 25-year-old is not right, or that you don't come back drunk, bruised, half-naked and bleeding from seeing your friends. My staff at that time actually were aware that abuse was taking place, but they saw it as isolated incidents, and they tried to work in an isolated way in relation to that with young people who were unable to cooperate, with young people who were unable to tell. How, how many isolated incidents does it take to get people to recognise that there is a group problem here? I think where we are now is a very different place to where we were then. We kind of go around the rain at Marsden, 
We heard today about how police and social workers in Oxfordshire had transformed their approach to child protection. New specialists, new structures, award-winning programmes, we were told. But we heard also about just how many girls and young women from the area they think may have suffered this type of horrific exploitation over the last two decades. 370, at least. Well, earlier I spoke to Sarah Thornton, the outgoing Chief Constable of Thames Valley Police, who's set to lead a new association representing senior police officers. I began by asking her what about her current force she's most ashamed of. We contributed fully to the report and accept its findings. Uh, it finds that it took too long to identify the sexual exploitation and that we made many errors. But what, what is it in terms of spe specific police behaviour that you feel ashamed of? What, what were they actually doing wrong out on the streets when they were dealing with these vulnerable young girls, mostly? There's, there's two sorts of uh, failures, I think, in the review. The first are organisational failures, where we failed to uh, identify the issue of sexual exploitation. We failed to join up the dots. We didn't train our officers. All of those things have been put right. Why is nobody being held to account is the question. You know, nobody's losing their job. Nobody's... What? You know, no, no, nobody's being disciplined. It's all just kind of, we've been retrained, we're on top of it now. I don't agree with you that nobody's being held to account. Um, I have been held to account over the last two and a half years by my Police and Crime Commissioner. Um, officers will be held to account through the process with the Independent Police Complaints Commission. And my giving an interview now is you holding me to account in public. Yes, but I mean, no, nobody's, nobody's lost their job, nobody's been demoted, nobody's been fined. Uh, in fact, you're, you're, you're about to leave your position, having been in charge through this period, uh, and go off and represent chief, uh, chief constables around the country. As I said, in many ways we've been held to account. Um, in terms of my own role, um, I've been the chief constable here for eight years, which is a long time by any comparison. I was offered a unique opportunity to lead a new organisation coordinating operations nationally. That is the only reason why I'm leaving Thames Valley Police. When did you realise? It's my responsibility to lead this force. It's, it's my responsibility to lead this force when it's doing well and when it's being criticised. So when did you first realise that your officers were getting this so badly wrong? I was first um, made aware of the issue of sexual exploitation in 2011. I think it was during the trial in 2013 when we began to look in detail and some of the evidence which was revealed at the Old Bailey that we began to realise that there were issues not just of organisational learning but maybe issues of conduct individually. So you had no idea until 2011 that this was going on in your force even though you've been a senior officer there since 2003? I was first briefed on this in 2011. The report goes into some detail about the failure to escalate. And what I've said, and it's printed in the report, is knowing what I know now, of course I'd wanted to be told earlier, but I wasn't. Chief Constable, thanks very much.